And all God's people said, Amen. It is a great privilege to be in worship today, and especially today, in that our uh, lead pastor candidate, Brett Lively, Pastor Brett Lively, and his wife Sharda, and their sons, Elijah and Josiah, are with us this morning. So at this time, uh, Brett, will you come forward, and I'd like to have prayer with you. Uh, he has been in ministry as lead pastor over 20 years. He comes to us from Las Vegas, is where they planted churches there. Many of you met them last night, but today may be the first opportunity. You have a chance to, to see Brent face to face and Sharda and the family. Let's just have a word of prayer for Brent as he brings the word to us this morning. God and our Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for Brent and Sharda and the entire family. And I pray, Lord, that you would lead us, you would show us your will. We pray, God, that the word that you have for us, we would hear, anoint Brent as he shares the word to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it is a, an honor to be with all of you today. And so, good morning. We're excited to be here. And uh, when we stepped off the plane, my boys were just amazed at the beauty. And they said, my oldest son said, Dad, it looks like a Bob Ross painting. <laughs> so it is so beautiful. And uh, we enjoyed the rain on Friday. Oh, my goodness, that was so refreshing. We don't get a lot of rain in Las Vegas. And so when it does rain, it's just like the 4th of July. Just people go crazy and uh, get out the popcorn and the lawn chairs and just have, take it all in. Well, this morning, uh, I'm going to be talking about discipleship. And I, one of the things that first attracted me to Clinton Frame is when I looked at the website and I saw the vision statement and making, launch, making and launching disciples of Jesus to transform the world. And I love the word launching because Sharda and I have been in the process of launching churches in the past. And even recently, we launched our daughter, uh, Shiloh. She's not able to be with us here. She's at college. But we launched her uh, into college. And so I had the joy of going to help her get into the, her dorm room and and she's in college in Nebraska. And so we had a great day, father, daughter, had a great time. And then, as you know, it came time for the goodbye. And that was more difficult than I thought. So I gave her a hug and we prayed together and uh, said goodbye. I thought goodbye. But when I got in the truck, I could not leave the parking lot. The grief came over me like I have never known. Nobody told me that would be so hard. And I want you to know, I cried out to the Lord, and the Lord reminded me that my daughter was being launched. That the discipleship, her next step of discipleship to Jesus was being launched to be a light to the college in Nebraska. And that helped me. That helped me to get down the road and to trust in God that he is going to complete the good work that he started in all of us. So my message this morning is to talk about the launching of disciples of Jesus. That is really the passion of my heart. And Jesus, he called the 12 disciples... He poured his life into them, and then they, in turn, they poured their lives into other disciples. And that's how the world, that's how we know the world has been transformed through the body of Christ. So my purpose this morning is I want every one of you to respond to the gospel. Every one of you to become a disciple of Jesus, because that's where it begins. And secondly, I pray that all of you would respond to the call to discipleship, to be involved in getting another person 
further along in their journey with Christ. And third, I pray that many of you would respond to take up the call to missions, not only uh, in other countries, but right here in the United States. So that is what I pray that God will do this morning through the message. The, there are three imperatives in Matthew 28, and that's what I'm going to go over. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28, and I will be reading the Great Commission. starting at verse 16 through 20. And I am reading out of the NIV. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the three imperatives that Jesus outlines here are very simple. So if you want to write these down, the first is Jesus' claim. Second is Jesus' command. And last is Jesus' comfort. First of all, Jesus' claim of all authority. All authority has been given to me in verse 19. And this is defined by heaven and earth. When we look at what the command is saying, it's, it's basically God is saying, I have given all authority to my son Jesus. And Jesus has authority in heaven, but also in earth. And so we need to remember that this morning, that God has the authority to command us to make disciples. This is something that, that when Jesus calls us, he also commands us, but it's with his authority. And that's something that I do want us to see, and that it implies that we need to respond to his rule, to the reign of Christ. And I would like you to, to see an example from Scripture, the response to Jesus' rule in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through, actually I'll just read verses 1. And in this passage, what we find is that Isaiah sees the Lord seated on the throne of heaven. And I believe this is Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts. And as he sees the Lord, something very very powerful happens. So let's go there to verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. After this happened, I believe the Lord saw not only the Lord's authority in his life, but he saw that his life was not his own. And I, I want to, us to hear that this morning. Our lives are not our own. And we need to see Jesus. When we see Jesus, we will begin to hear him speak. And this is what happened to Isaiah. He heard the Lord speak to him. Whom shall I send? So go with me now to verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. I pray that all of us would begin to hear the Lord, but to respond to the Lord's authority in our lives. And I'd, I'd like us to just think of it like this. This is one way to actually practice it, is just declare every day. My life is not my own. So I'd like us to practice it right now. Would you say it with me? My life is not my own. We could even add to that, my life has been purchased with a price. And we know what the price is, right? The, the cost of Jesus' life, the blood of Jesus. So I want us to see that when we respond 
to Jesus. We will hear God's voice. And when we respond to God's voice, we will begin to hear God's call on our life to make disciples because that's what God has called us to do is to make disciples. When Shard and I first were, began to hear the Lord that he wanted us to uh, go to Las Vegas, we were in Breckenridge, Texas. And I was pastoring a church there and I just began to experience a greater, just a greater understanding of Christ's authority in my life. And so I began to really think about what it meant to say that my life was not my own. And in that process of discerning the Lord's will for our lives, I, uh, I began to believe that I was hearing that God was putting in my heart to plant, to plant churches and to plant a church in Las Vegas. And so I went to my wife and I told Sharda, I said, I really believe the Lord is speaking to me to plant a church in Las Vegas. And she said, I think you're crazy. <laughs> but as we prayed together and we listened to God, we began to lay our hearts before the Lord and, and voice that same prayer that Isaiah prayer, prayed. Lord, send, here we are, send us. And our prayer was, Lord, send us to where the need is the greatest and, and few are willing to go. And that's, that was our heart. And that's really what I wanted to share with you first this morning is that's who we are. And that's who we need to be as followers of Christ is to always respond to the authority of Christ in our lives and that our lives are not our own. And that's how we went to Las Vegas and with that sense of obeying the Lord and following his will. And that's still our heart today. So I want to share with you just some, some ways to respond today. First of all, start declaring, as I said, my life is not my own in your prayer time. Secondly, respond to God's authority daily through his word. Ask the Holy Spirit, reveal to me what, what, what is the Lord saying to me today? What is he saying and what does he want me to do? And then do it. And Third, declare whatever the Lord commands, I will do. The second imperative of the Great Commission is Jesus' command to go and make disciples, verse 19. And it begins with therefore. And we need to begin thinking about, well, what is the therefore, therefore? Well, it's there because Christ is saying to the church, He's saying, I, bo I have both authority in, in heaven and earth, but I also have power to back it up. I have the power to not only call you to make disciples, but I have the power to, to give you strength to actually do it and fulfill my purpose. And that's important because we need God's power. We need his strength to be able to fulfill the Great Commission. We cannot do it in our own strength. How many of you have found this out? So it's something that we do need to think about. And also the, de the definition of a disciple is actually the word in the Greek is uh, methetes. So it's very easy. So you can just remember it like this. Spell the word math and then add E-T-E-S. Methetes, and it basically means being apprentice, an apprentice of Jesus, being a learner. And this is how, during Jesus' time on the earth, disciples were disciples of rabbis, and they would learn the Torah, they would learn the scriptures, and they would go to hear them teach. But when Jesus began to uh, make disciples, he transformed this term because he did something no one had ever done before. He began to share his life with them. He began to, he didn't just teach his disciples. They went on trips with him. They went on we to weddings with him. They also shared meals with them. And they shared laughter and joy. And this is how Jesus shared his life with them. And this is something that I want us to hear today because that, that's what we want to do as disciples. That's what it means to make disciples is first we must be a disciple. And Paul, the apostle said, 
In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So there's a process here of us being an apprentice to Jesus. And then we, in turn, begin to make apprentices, apprentices, so that we can apprentice them to Jesus. And it is a wonderful, wonderful process of training others. How many of you here like movies? Anybody? Can I see a show of hands? All right, so we like movies too. How about um, Star Wars? Any Star Wars fans here? All right, so there's a few. Um, how about, does anyone have any of the Star Wars movies on VHS? Wow. That is amazing. Well, I love the Star Wars trilogy. I, I, I love the Star Wars films because there's so many parallels if you find them to the spiritual life. And I think that um, for me, I mean, first of all, I'm a big Chewbacca fan. And so anybody just out there, Chewbacca fans, uh, that's, and there's just something about Chewie when, you know, his, his uh, Wookiee call that he makes just makes me feel alive. <laughs> well, in the first uh, trilogy, the first movie, there is there's a parallel to discipleship because, you know, um, Obi-Wan is training Luke to become a Jedi, to actually eventually become a Jedi master. And in this one scene, Obi-Wan uh, puts over this shield over Luke's head and, and, and with this blast shield over his face where he can't see. And he's trying to get him to stop focusing on his senses and to really focus on using the force. And, and I love that scene because it really is... Uh, helps us to see the, a parallel in our own lives, something that God has put deep in us, and that's to be, become a disciple. And we need to be trained. We need to be discipled by other people. We need, and we do that in the context of community. And we need others who come alongside of us and help us to be able to learn how to trust in God and how to trust in his authority and how to trust in his power. So I want to call you this morning to recognize the importance of the church and the role that the community of Christ plays in actually making disciples. Jesus gives us the next step in verse 20. Obeying everything I have commanded you. And I think that, that those words today, we need to take those to heart that it's not just doing the things that we want to do or we like to do, but it is obeying all the commands of Christ and everything he calls us to do. Recently, we were reaching out to a young lady, and her name is Nargis, and she, in her, she's in her 30s, and she came uh, here to the United States from a Muslim nation. And Nargis was um, fleeing her country because her husband had died of a heart attack. And he was a medical doctor there, has died suddenly. And she had, has a little girl, Sonia, who's three years, was then three years old. And according to Islamic law, her daughter would have to go, after the death of her husband, would have to go to her husband's parents to be raised and that they, would take, that they would take her into their home. And so those mother and daughter would be split. And so she, by the grace of God, she fled her country, and she went to L.A. first, Los Angeles, and then to Las Vegas, and she started attending one of our services. And at first, um, our congregation, some of the people were afraid. They were afraid that she might be tied to a terrorist, and as we begin to pray and we discern the, the, what God was doing, we realize, oh my goodness, this is, God has sent this young woman here and she wants to receive, she wants to know Christ. And we began to just help her. I mean, she was trying to learn the language and, and, and I called Sharda one day and said, what can we do to help her to get a job? She needs a job. 
And so Sharda called this school that my kids, a, a private school that they had gone to, and uh, she went to the school. And, and lo and behold, when, when she took her for the interview, the director of the school uh, could, spoke fluent, uh, the language that she was from, fluent uh, Farsi. And th this is just amazing. I mean, God is so amazing, isn't he? He just is so far ahead of us, and he planned all of And then it wasn't, not, not only did she get the job, but then her daughter was able to go start learning the language, to go to preschool. And then other people in the congregation would take her to, to the worship service and then take her home. And people were reaching out to her, helping her. Someone helped her get a driver's license. And then others helped her. I mean, we just came, uh, and everyone just embraced her and showed her the love of Jesus. Six months later, she received Christ and was baptized. Come on, we need to give a shout out for God on that one. Come on. We don't need to be afraid of Muslims. They need Christ. So we have a, a job to play. And, and this is something that's happening now is that, is that people everywhere are trying to find Christ and we have an opportunity to reach them. So I want to call you back this morning to the mission of Christ. The most important mission on this earth is making disciples of Jesus. I'm calling the church back to its, its calling, to the mandate of Jesus. And so I want you to think about how to respond to Jesus' command today in your own life. First of all, I think that what you're going through right now as a church with the shape process, learning about your spiritual gifts, I think that's a great place to start. Because when you find out a, where, how you're gifted, then you kind of know how to, how to get connected and how to utilize your unique giftedness. I mean, all the people that were helping Nargis, I mean, it was a team of people. They were all using all kinds of different gifts, gifts of administration, gifts of helps, gifts of prayer. But all of us together, we were able to help her. And that's how it is with the church. We, we, we use our gifts, but you have to take the time that it takes to understand what they are and, and how God's going to use you. Secondly, is we need to build relationship with others. Get involved in the Sunday school. The first time we were, uh, you know, when we experienced the, the Sunday school, we realized that this is dynamic. This is so good. What a wonderful way to build relationships, and especially in the small groups. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that. And number three, assist others in their growth. Just look around. And pay attention to who are those around you like Nargis that are hungry and they want to know, they want more. And they need, you know, they may not even be able to come to a Bible study, but they may need someone to help them in some way or spend time with them or help them with their homework. All of this is what I call an all of life discipleship. It's not just head knowledge. In America today, we have a lot of people that have a lot of head knowledge, a lot of Bible knowledge in their heads. But beloved, until it comes down into their hearts. That's, that's what we need, is the transformation of the heart. And that, I believe, will give you a heart for others to disciple them. And the third imperative of the Great Commission is Jesus' comfort. Oh, I love this one because... Jesus says in verse 20, Surely I will be with you. And this is really talking about the importance of the presence of Christ. Jesus' presence is everything. We need his presence. Think about Psalm 1611. King David said, The joy in his presence is the fullness of joy. Think about the, how when we experience the presence of Christ, it brings so much joy and peace into our lives. And we need that kind of peace in making disciples. Why do we need that kind of peace? Because there's a cost to discipleship. The cost of discipleship is, is part of it is the opposition that we will face as we obey these commands and we fulfill the Great Commission. I'm telling you, 
you will face opposition from the enemy. And I believe it was Lisa that was, what a powerful testimony. Where are you, Lisa? Thank you. First of all, your, your transparency and your vulnerability is so beautiful and that you have such a deep relationship with Christ that you are secure in that, that you can share that with others. Because I guarantee you, there's not one person in here that hasn't faced something similar and, and felt those, those, t- those deep groans of the heart where you're just crying out to God. And I know the cost of discipleship means that we will face persecutions. We will face difficulties. We will face sicknesses. There will be times that people even will walk away from the Lord that you are pouring your life into. There's times that people will even betray you, that you just were really trying to help. And I'm telling you, all those things, the enemy wants to try to get you to turn back or to discourage you. And now I want to just share from my heart this morning. In 2014, I experienced something personally in my own ministry that was just so discouraging. And I just had never, I'm a pretty, I'm just a positive person. You know, I get up in the morning and I'm not quite as positive as my wife, but she just gets up with a song in her heart. I got to have some coffee and get me, get myself going. But I experienced some deep, deep anguish of my soul, like you were talking about, Lisa. And it just really, you know, concerned me. And I cried out to God, discouraged. And that's when I realized this is the cost. I cannot turn back. Even though the enemy is discouraged, trying to discourage me, I cannot. And I, as you call out to Christ like I did, I'm telling you it's his presence that will get you through it. It's his presence, and it's the triune presence of the Godhead. And Jesus, in this passage, it's there. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's one of the reasons why I love the Wizard of Oz. Because the Wizard of Oz, you know, you know the story. Dorothy um, gets displaced from her home in Kansas because of a tornado. And her little dog, Toto, and... She goes on this journey to to get back home, to try to find her way back home. She has to go to see the Wizard of Oz. And then by a set of circumstances, these three companions come along to accompany her and really comfort her and help her. You remember the lion and the tin man and the scarecrow? And that's how it is in the spiritual life. The Father and the Son they, and the Holy Spirit, they come alongside of us. This is why King David, when he, when he says in the 23rd Psalm, he says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's God speaking to you this morning. He's saying, Surely, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know if you've been struggling with an injury like Lisa, maybe some type of a sickness, maybe some type of a financial hardship that's just caused some pressure in your life. But I want you to know this. God cares and God loves you. He loves you so much. Just remember what he did. He sent his only begotten son to come and to die in your place so that you could receive eternal life. So that you could receive not only the power and the authority of Christ in your life, but that you would receive his comfort. Would you just take a moment and let the comfort of the Holy Spirit come come into your heart? Let's recite together as I close. Let's recite the Great Commission. And I'd like us to do it slowly, to really let it soak in and come into our hearts.
verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, could we read together? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So go and make disciples. Be a disciple of Jesus. Take the next step today to make disciples and fulfill the great commission. Amen. We're going to sing a song and then we're going to come back for a time of a commitment prayer because I want to give an opportunity for those of you that have not received Jesus in your heart to do that today, that you would have an opportunity to, to call upon the Lord. We're also going to have an opportunity to pray and seek the Lord in a prayer. Would you please stand?
this time of commitment. So I encourage you to open your heart to Jesus. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, this is an opportunity to do that. And I would just like every eye to be closed, every head to bow our heads. And if that's you this morning and you would like to make that commitment, just raise, raise up your hand and say, that's me. I'm ready. I'm ready to become a disciple of Jesus. I don't wanna, I don't wanna hold back anymore. I don't wanna let anything keep me from moving forward. And now we pray, Father, that you would first of all forgive us for allowing so many things to keep us distracted from fulfilling the Great Commission. Forgive us, Father, for our sins. Forgive us for idolatry, for just busyness, focusing on so many different things and forgetting about the most important imperative of all your command to make disciples and now we pray as a church Holy Spirit would you come and give us the courage to step out today and to take the next step the next step of discipleship getting involved at Clinton Frame getting involved in a ministry getting involved in relationships We ask you, Holy Spirit, to give us that power to make disciples and to impart your presence into our lives so that we have the joy of the Lord in our making disciples and we have the strength of the Lord in all that we do. And now last we pray, Father, give us a heart today like yours. We want to be like Jesus. Would you just say that with me? I want to be like Jesus. That is the goal of my life. Could you say that? That is a goal of my life. So we're going to extend an opportunity for you to come forward. Our ministry team is going to come. And this is an, this is an opportunity for you to receive prayer. Would our prayer team come? If you need prayer, come forward come and receive and if it's a sense of wanting more to go further a commissioning even if you will we're here to do to do that as well to pray for you to help you in your discipleship to Jesus and help you go to the next step in making disciples Sharda would you come and join me
fellowship meal immediately after the worship service and then after the fellowship meal, there'll be a time of questioning, uh, a question and answers uh, to, again, questions that you may have uh, with, for Brent and Sharda. So we look forward to a good time of fellowship and learning and discerning what the Lord has for us. Now unto him who is able to exceedingly more than we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church now and forever. Amen. Amen. And you may want to greet uh, Brent and Sharda in the foyer as you go out. Lord bless you.